Welcome to Dodgers Daily. I'm Casey Porter. I'm so glad that you decided to tune in. What started out as such a glorious weekend. You went 6-0 and on Friday, and you beat the Yankees in the first game of the series, and all the minor league teams won, including a doubleheader sweep by the Great Lakes Loons, and it ends by losing the series to the Yankees, two games to one, losing both on Saturday and Sunday, and then also both yesterday and today in the minor league system. You went two and two, so two and three, all in all, both days, four and six over Saturday and Sunday. In the system, not exactly what you're looking for, but hey, it is what it is. So hey, before we dive into this show too much, we have a lot to get to. Every team was in action today. Again, two and three. You lost at the Los Angeles level, Oklahoma City won, Tulsa won, and then Great Lakes and Rancho, they lost their games. But before we get into that too much, just a reminder, if you'd like to help Dodgers Daily by donating, we do now have a GoFundMe account just scroll down to the description and click the link there and it'll take you right to the gofundme for dodgers daily also if you like this video and if you like this kind of content go ahead and click that like button leave a comment tell all your friends about dodgers daily share this video become a subscriber and after you subscribe click that notification bell and please leave a comment let's keep talking dodgers baseball i love the community we have built here so keep leaving comments okay so again frustrating weekend all the way around especially if you follow the minor leaguers too right the rancho cucamonga quakes they just simply couldn't score at great lakes they had a chance to set you know a franchise record with 11 game winning streak in a row they lost to beloit who beloit thank goodness for them they ended their 13 game losing streak and then you know hey the la dodgers they lose the last two games to the Yankees, of course, Bobby Miller, he pitched great. But, hey, let's not waste any more time. Let's get right to it, and let's talk Dodgers baseball. So the Dodgers dropped a 35-25 and on the season, 20-10 and at home, 15-15 and on the road, a place of which the Dodgers will be for the next six games. Coming up on the road at Cincinnati and then Philadelphia for a quick six-game road swing on the East Coast there. So, hey, a chance, you know, maybe to make some hate right there. We've talked about that stretch. But, again, a disappointing day Sunday. It was exciting to watch Bobby Miller pitch. We're going to get into all about his performance and some of the things that made him so successful. But the offense, man, it just was not there. Okay, just one run on the home run by J.D. Martinez. Just four hits. None of the guys, one through four, in your lineup had a hit. And, boy, any time the top of your lineup, one through four, they don't get hits, it's going to be a very, very, very difficult day. Okay, the Dodgers were – they didn't have very many people in runners in scoring position, and they did not get a hit with runners in scoring position. They were 0 for 3 with runners in scoring position. Okay, J.D. Martinez, he scored the only run with his home run. That tied the game. That was home run number 14 for him. He now has hits in 17 of his last 18 games, and he has raised his batting average – 38 points since May 19th. J.D. Martinez, he has been super hot. And in that time, okay, he has nine home runs, and he has 20 RBIs, 14 runs scored, and 52 total bases. So not only is he raising his batting average, he's also slugging. And, you know, I've talked about this in podcasts before. The Dodgers love versatility. It's very difficult for them to go out and pay a whole lot of money to a guy who just plays one position, and that's only on one side of the ball, which is offense being a DH. So I guarantee you it was tough for them to do that. But, hey, J.D. Martinez is that good. And he is proving the club right for doing that. And he has been very, very, very hot. And he tied the game today with his 14th home run of the season. Okay, so that's about it. That's about all you have to talk about with the offense today. Let's talk about the pitching. Bobby Big Time. Bobby Miller was very, very, very good. Okay, let me kind of get dive into an adjustment the organization made. Okay, Bobby Miller, you know, we know he can hit above 100 with that four seam. You know, he's hit 101. I think he's hit 102 in the past. But I've talked about in the past, hey, that four seam that he tries to hit the glove side to, that's the one that gets hit the most because it flattens out and or he pulls it for a ball. So guess what adjustment the organization made? They transitioned him to a two seam pitcher. I've also stated in the past, his biggest strength, and you know, just naturally, he has that arm side movement, that arm side ride to 
his fastball, and that's very natural for him. So, hey, coming up to the major leagues, what can we do to make things a little bit easier on Bobby Miller where he can relax and just do things that are natural to him? Well, the organization, they moved him to a two-seam, and it has been absolutely dynamite for him. Okay, Bobby Miller, okay, and here's another thing. Before we move into some more of – some of the ways that he pitched. I know one of the big questions was, hey, why did you bring him out? He was at less than 100 pitches. He was cruising, and then it made it look even worse when Bruce Dar Gratterall gave up the run in the next inning. Well, let me say this. Okay, the Yankees, they left their guy in, and the Dodgers scored a run off of him after they left him in in the seventh inning. So, hey, it's six one way. Half dozen the other, the way it worked out. Bobby Miller came out on a high. And who's to say he wouldn't have just like the Yankees guy did, uh, Ermond, go out and give up a run as well in the seventh inning. So I think that's a coin flip. I think that's six one way, half dozen the other to begin with just from a strategy. But when you throw this into the equation, I think it was a slam dunk for Dave Roberts. Okay, Bobby Miller, you got to keep in mind. Okay, he did not pitch his first game this year until April 29th. He had, you know, he he, he didn't, he started, he ramped up late. I'm not going to get into all the details. I don't know how much at liberty I am to do that with anyways. But well, I'll just say he didn't throw, you know, his first pitch in a real game as far as with an affiliate until April 29th. I mean, that's just a little bit over a month ago, okay? So he has seven outings this year, okay? And here's the pitch counts in those seven outings. 55, 54, 68, 76. Those were the four outings he had in Oklahoma City. He hadn't thrown more than 76 pitches. In his first two outings, he threw 55 and 54. Then in his first outing with Los Angeles, he threw 95. So that ramped up quite a bit, okay? Way more than what he had thrown to that point in the season. Last outing, he threw 87. Tonight, he was at 86, okay? So his pitch count is right in line with where his rehab should be right now, okay? You know, the last thing you want is Bobby Miller going back on the shelf and being injured again. So it was no doubt, you know, strategically, again, you know, the the Yankees guy, again, Armand, he gave up around the seventh inning anyway. So from a strategic perspective, again, I think it's a coin flip. But whenever you throw into the fact that he was right there at his pitch limit, his pitch count limit anyways, okay, I think – you know, and I know that that David Cohn brought this up on the broadcast, and I think he's exactly right. Hey, more than likely, if Bobby Miller goes out there, the first guy that gets on, he's out anyways. So why not give Bruce Dar Gratterall a clean inning and let him come in and work his own inning from that perspective? So I actually agree with the decision. Leave me a comment. Tell me what you think. Again, I love the war room and the comments that we have on each and every video. I love it when we all have our different opinions on everything. But, hey, that's my opinion, and that's the data and the statistics that I back that up with. Okay, so Bobby Miller. I mentioned that the, the, the club, they transitioned him to a two seam because he has natural arm side movement. I think that's allowed him to relax because he's not trying to do something that's not natural to him. He's just using his, his natural talents to, you know, just let the ball come out of the hand and run like it normally does. Okay, today, 38 two seam sinkers. 38, okay. Now, check this out. He threw just nine four seams. That four seam is the one that gets up over 100. Okay, and again, that's effective because that sinker has that right turn to it, and then, you know, the slider has the left turn. Okay, and because of that, because he had the right turn to the two sink to the two seam, whenever he threw that slider, 58% whiff rate. That slider, I've been telling you guys, you know, ever since we've talked about Bobby Miller, you know, everybody wants to talk about the 101, the 102. The fastball, the four seam's not his best pitch. It just isn't. His two-seam slider combo, that's when Bobby Miller's at his best. That's what you saw today. Not even the New York Yankees could hit it. So you have proof at the major league level that that combination is that good for Bobby Miller. That's how talented he is. He can hit 102 with the four-seam. It's not his best pitch. And as a matter of fact, it's only a pitch that he threw nine times to get through the Yankees through six innings scoreless. That's how talented Bobby Miller is. And, hey, give the Dodgers organization credit because they're north-south club, man. They like the riding four seams. They like the tumbling change-ups. And they like the up and down, you know, in in the – as far as the – 
the the pitch mix of guys. So, hey, you know, John Rooney, I know they went back to East-West for him. They they moved back with Bobby Miller. I've said it, too, with Gavin Stone. He ditched his two-seam this year. I think he needs to go back to being more of an East and West type pitcher instead of the North-South guy trying to ride four seams up and tumbling change ups down. They did it with Bobby Miller. It worked. They now have visual evidence that, hey, the East-West thing does work. Super successful with Bobby Miller. He is, you know, his presence, he, he's very competitive. You know, I know Doug McCain from Dodgers Nation, who does just a wonderful job, I think is probably the best source of Dodgers information out there. He just does a great job. He mentioned that, hey, you know, Bobby Miller just carries himself big time, like a big time dude. Okay, so, you know, that's part of his game right there. And, uh, you know, just to give an example. Okay, last performance in Oklahoma City, Bobby Miller threw his four seam, 53% of the time. He threw it only nine times today. Okay, that's a massive adjustment to make, you know, whenever you're jumping levels and then also making that adjustment. Okay, and his last outing in Oklahoma City, he only threw four sinkers the entire game. Okay, and the sinker is what he threw the most today. Okay, he threw 38 of them today. Think about that adjustment that the organization made with him. They sat him down, they went, What do you do naturally? Okay, let's just go to that, let's make you feel comfortable. And they did it. They put it in place. They put that plan in place, and they accented his strengths, okay? And boy, Bobby Miller went out there and absolutely executed it beautifully. You know, of course, that's not consolation to the fact the team lost, but it was not obviously Bobby Miller's fault. or He had had absolutely nothing to do with that. It was the offense. I mean, point blank. And then obviously, you know, the bullpen, I've said it on two or three you know, podcasts in a row. <laughs> I have no idea what to tell you about the bullpen. Hey, more uncertainty today. How about two guys, Caleb Ferguson and Evan Phillips, who are usually just pretty close to automatic? They give up runs today. Bruce Dark Gratterall obviously uh, also gave up a run too. So, hey, Bruce Dark Gratterall, not, not quite as surprised as you might be with Evan Phillips and then Caleb Ferguson. But, hey, just more uncertainty. It just seems like, hey, you know, whack that mole. You know, as soon as we think we have this part of it over here solved, then, you know, a mole jumps up over here. Now you got to solve that problem. That just, like I've said many different times, that seems to be the bullpen. I have no suggestions for you. I have no solution. One of the silver linings to to losing this weekend to the Yankees, it was a big-time series. It was prime time. It was on on Sunday night baseball. It was, you know, it had the whole world of baseball, you know, captive to it. Everybody wanted to watch it. And you lose at home two to three to the Yankees. One silver lining to that, okay, it might make the front office realize they need to be more aggressive at the trade deadline. It might make them get back in that war room and go, you know what, this sucks losing two to three at home in a primetime matchup to Yankees. Maybe we're not ready to win a World Series with the roster we have, so maybe we need to start doing a little bit more homework and make sure that we're aggressive at the trade deadline to fill in the holes to make sure that we can beat the Yankees the next time we play them. I'm looking for silver linings. Maybe that's it. Okay, am I grasping for straws? Leave me a comment on that. So again, hey, the Dodgers lose two out of three. The other silver lining is, hey, the Braves were able to beat the Diamondbacks this weekend and keep the Dodgers tied for first place in the NOS. So, hey, that's our talk on the Dodgers for today. Time now to move to the minor league system. So let's not waste any more time and let's take a trip down on the farm. The AAA Oklahoma City Dodgers, they won 7-4 to to move their record to 41-16. and And I'm telling you, since I think it was 2015, when the Dodgers moved to both Oklahoma City and Tulsa, made those two of the affiliates, there's been some dudes. You know, you're talking about Corey Seager and Walker Bueller, Dustin May, all these guys, Julio Urias, all these guys have come through Oklahoma City. I don't ever remember a 41-16 and record, so this has been just absolutely phenomenal. Jemai Jones has been just super smoking hot and the reason why you're 41 and 16 one because you're pitching especially your bullpen has been very good we saw taylor scott come up just the other day but then guys like this jamai jones luke williams drew avens devin mann you know these young guys that are super super hungry to make it to the major leagues it's been a great mix with guys like patrick mazika david freitas who had two hits today that you know it's been a great mix of of older guys that are veterans that can kind of you know give these younger guys the idea of what it's like to be in the major leagues and some of these younger guys like luke williams you know they have already been 
in the major leagues, you know, Jemai Jones, uh, and, and they know what it's like. They, they have that taste, and so that only has added to their hunger. So for that perspective, you have, you have a bunch of super motivated guys, guys that play the game right, guys that just play the game hard, and because of that, you know, you look up and you're 57 games into it, and you're, you've won 41 of them, which is super, super impressive. Again, Drew Avon said his fifth home run of the season today. Jemai Jones, he hit this home run here. Third game in a row, he's hit a home run. Justin Yurchak went one for two. He's hitting 273 on the season. Patrick Mazika had a hit. And like I said, David Freitas had a couple of knocks as well. And Bryson Brigman had a hit as well. And also De- Devin Manning, we're going to talk about here in just a second, had a couple knocks as well. So I talk all the time about, you know, Emanuel Vargas might be the most or probably is the most underrated offensive player in the entire system. Well, I think Devin Mann, you know, I think he is probably overall the most underrated overall prospect and player in the Dodgers minor league system. The things that he can do for a team are just absolutely, you know, limitless. You know, he can play every position on the field. He, he, he has, other than pitcher and catcher, he's played every position on the field and not just played every position, but done a good job there. Hey, and just quietly, you know, he's very unassuming. He's not loud. He's not brash. He's not in your face. He's just that kind of Midwestern, you know, laid back type of of quiet. And because of that, I think he goes underrated. Okay, he had two hits today, including his league-leading 22nd double that you're seeing right here. Hey, the second-place guy in the PCL only has 16, so he leads the league in doubles by six. Okay, and he extended his hit streak, Devin Mann did, to nine games. Nine games, and his on-base streak to 20 Four, chasing that 53 of Drew Avens last year. That was awesome to watch when Avens did that. Okay, so hey, you know, Devin Mann's having a good year. He's hitting 287, OPS 888, so keep up the great work, Devin. So the next part of this is kind of interesting. You know, hey, I had a chance to talk to the AAA manager, Travis Barbary this past week, and I asked him one of the specific questions I wanted it to, to get into. Hey, there's been a debate. Okay, the ABS system, automatic balls and strikes, the challenge system. So what they're doing in the minor leagues is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they're actually using the automated balls and strikes, the robo-umps, and then on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they transition to the challenge system. So I wanted to uh, ask Travis Barbary what he thought about both systems. Hey, do you like the, the ABS system? Do you like the challenge system better or just none of it at all? And here was his answer. Personally, I would rather just go with umpire's pull in the game. Okay. Um, and if we don't do that, the challenge system for me would be the best. Like the ABS just seems, uh, the zone seems very small this year. Uh, walks seemed seem big last year, didn't it? Yeah, and it's smaller this year for sure. And the walks seem to go up on uh, the first three games of the series. And um, But I like the challenge system. Yeah. Um, that way, players, you wish it came from the from the bench instead of the players? No, like I think the players, I think they've got the right idea. Like, um, if they're going to challenge it, they got to do it right away. Yeah. And, uh, Jemai did it the other night really good on yeah. a really close pitch. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't know how the umpires feel about it, but I know that, like, they're still developing their skill set to call games in the big leagues, and when they're doing automated strike zones, they're losing out on the opportunity to get better behind the plate, and I think that they would probably tell you they'd rather call the game, too. And I think players would agree that they'd rather have umpires call the game. So, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll see, but... Um, yeah, it's an adjustment from the first three games of the series to the last three for sure. Yeah. So Johnny DeLuca just got called up. Congratulations to him. And I had a chance to also talk to him when I went on Wednesday night to AAA Oklahoma City. Okay, and here are some of his thoughts about at the time. Of course, he hadn't been called up yet, but we talked about, hey, you know, you're a Southern Cowboy and you're just one hot streak away from the Major League. So how do you keep yourself from having those thoughts and maybe pressing because of that? Okay, here's what he had to say. I mean, it's tough and stuff like you said but just yeah, it's so far out of my control I can't do anything besides go out there and play my game every day and uh, hope for the best but um, just you know control the control the double a Tulsa drillers they continue to roll on and win close games they scored two in the top of the tenth this game went extra innings it was high drama on the plains in Wichita Kansas Jordan Leisure and John Rooney they held the fort and held Wichita down to allow the game to go to extra innings and lo and behold the 
the, the excuse me, the Double A Tulsa Drillers. They got a two out base hit to score in the top of the tenth. You know, you have the the guy that automatically goes to second base, but hey, they hadn't scored him yet. They got a two out hit to score him, then they scored another run, took a two run lead, lead into the bottom of the tenth, and then held on and won six to five to move their record to thirty five and sixteen on the season. Your bit Vivas here had a huge day for the Double A Tulsa Drillers. We'll talk more about him here in a minute but hey other guys that had good days austin gothier he had another hit today he went one for three and a couple of rbis eddie's leonard he had a hit he went one for four his average is up to 231 again he had a slow start and he is gradually climbing his way out of the cellar there and brandon lewis had another hit he went one for four as well so hey the double a tulsa drillers again they they just keep on rolling on yorbit vivas hit home run number six of the season right there kapow wow and like i said man when he hits a ball he has a lot of bat speed he's able to swing a little bit harder than a lot of other guys because he's so strong and he has he's so he's so flexible he's able to put you know all of that might behind his swing but not move his head not jerk his head okay so this was home run number six and he also had a single to go with that and he has three multi-hit games in a row you gotta love it when you hit a home run and then you just dink one right back with the, up the middle you know it is your day okay so three multi-hit games in a row for your bet Vivas. three out of his last five and he has 16 multi-hit games total on the year your bet Vivas's his average is up to 298 ops 857 the drillers used five different pitchers landon knack it was his second start of the week in wichita and second start that didn't go exactly the way that he wanted to. He went four and two-thirds innings, gave up three runs, had four strikeouts, just one walk and six hits. Ryan Sublet threw two innings and gave up a run. John Rooney, who you're seeing right here, went two-thirds of an inning. He was the fireman today. He came in and had two strikeouts. He got strikeouts for both of his outs, both of the guys that he faced. Then Jordan Leisure, high drama, one and two-thirds innings. He was the one who kind of held the fort and got it to extra innings not kind of he was the guy that got it to extra innings with his one and two-thirds scoreless he had a strikeout as well and then ben harris came in in the bottom of the tenth when the drillers had taken that two-run lead and he gave up one run and had two strikeouts two walks and one hit and he actually got the save on the afternoon in extra innings so john rooney you're seeing right here continued his really good relief work for double a tulsa yes i said relief he is in a relief role this year in 2023 and he is he completed his third consecutive scoreless outing, and he lowered his ERA down to 282. John Rooney. I mentioned that Jordan Leisure was the guy that came in and held the fort and got the game into extra innings. So, man, he was super, super clutch. I've talked in the past about Jordan Leisure, how things just never bother him. He's just a really cool cat, really cool customer, always has his composure underneath him, and that's why he is just so clutch in these big time moments like it was today look at that man that's 98 right there that is absolute gas from jordan leisure but hey man that really cool calm collected mentality he has works perfect in the late innings and the clutch parts of games and he was clutch again today he went one and two thirds innings like i said he kept the game tight and he has gone now jordan leisure four out of his last five outings scoreless and it was too bad tuesday night just as we left he was about to go scoreless in that he was down to one out it was like a four or five run lead for double a tulsa and a guy hit a home run on him otherwise that would be five out of five outings that he had gone scoreless in a row okay but it's four out of five and he's gone seven out of his last nine scoreless jordan leisure this is straight from brad tunney the play-by-play -play voice of the great lakes loons straight from his twitter the great lakes loons fell short of a franchise record 11th straight win on adversity on an adversity filled day okay still won 10 of 12 on the road trip those that road trip was peoria and then beloit where they've been this last week 77 to 34 an extending lead in division from three to seven magic number for the first half division title is nine for great lakes returning home 35 and 16 that is the fourth best record in the minor leagues again that is brad tunney straight from his twitter and again today it was a day you know beloit had lost 13 games in a row so it looked like a good it's a, you know a good day to go ahead and break records but it did not quite happen today and the great lakes loons they fell just short of winning like i said that that 
uh, record-setting 11th win in a row. So, so for the day, okay, the Great Lakes Loons, they did not score, and they only had five hits on the day. Jake Vogel had a hit. Yaner Fernandez was the offensive player of the day. He had two hits, and then Griffin Lockwood Pell. Actually, Griffin Lockwood Pell was the player of the day. He had two hits as well. I'm going to go ahead and play that again. Okay, so uh, it was a day where a little bit frustrating, but okay, so who you're looking at right here is Jack Dreyer, and Jack Dreyer, I'll tell you what, man, he's done a really good job. The young man out of Iowa who fought injury, and he came to, you know, he hadn't pitched in a long time, kind of like Mitchell Taransky, and he's gotten back on the mound. He went two innings, scored us in the bullpen for Great Lakes today, and he struck out three, and like I said, having a very good year, his ERA is just 233. He hasn't given up a run in his last five outings, and 12 of his last 13. So, hey, Jack Dreyer pitching very well. Keep up the great work. So, Great Lakes lost their starting pitcher, Jan Castro, to illness, I mean, right before the, the first pitch. So, it was an unscheduled bullpen game, which good thing it's on Sunday because you have the Monday off, the scheduled off day for minor leaguers. But that just means the guys in your bullpen, like you're seeing right here, Michael Hobbs, they've got to step up and they've got to extend. That's exactly what Michael Hobbs did. He went two innings. He did not give up a run, and he gave up no – hits. It was a wonderful outing for the all-time saves leader from St. Mary's. Again, two innings, scoreless, no hits. Hobbs has gone scoreless in six of his last seven, nine of his last 11, and 12 of his last 15. So, good job, Hobbsy. Way to come through for your team on a day where they needed you because it was an unscheduled bullpen day. Griffin Lockwood Powell had two hits for Great Lakes and has hits in five of his last seven games. A young man out of Central Michigan. You know, I like the fact that he's a big guy. He's a lot of power, but look how short his swing is, and it's very compact, and he can use all fields. He goes the other way with pitches very well, and he can also turn on inside pitches, and he's very versatile. You know, Locke, he can catch, he can play first base, so he can play different positions, something the Dodgers love, and you know, hey, good compact, short swing, and very powerful Griffin Lockwood Powell. For the second day in a row, the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes were only able to score one run. They lost 6-1 to one on Saturday. They lost 8-1 to one on Sunday, so they got outscored 14 14- to two over the weekend. Hey, sometimes that happens in baseball. You just go through streaks like that. The Quakes had six hits on the day. Two of them were by this young man right here out of Virginia Tech, Nick Bittison. He was the only Quake to have a multi-hit day. Luis Rodriguez, the center fielder, also had a hit. Or a Puerto, how about his versatility? He was the catcher yesterday, played left field on Sunday, and then Dayton Dooney and Kenneth Bettencourt both had hits as well. Hey, the best pitcher of the day as far as the best performance, you know, at least one of them, Madison Jeffrey, one and two-thirds innings. You know, I've always talked about with Madison, he has the fastball that reaches 100. Very, very good slider. Just get it in the strike zone. How about this? Three strikeouts and no walks for Madison Jeffrey. He did not give up a run either. That is not coincidental. You know, hey, when Madison Jeffrey throws strikes, and he is not giving away freebies. He does not give up runs. So it was good to see Madison Jeffrey have a very good outing and stay in the strike zone. And then Yoel Ibarra, you're seeing right here, he threw the last inning of the day scoreless in one inning, and he had a strikeout as well. Chris Campo started for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. He went two innings, and he gave up two runs. He had two strikeouts and no walks on the day. So David Tiburcio also pitched as well. So, again, hey, not a great Saturday and Sunday for Rancho Cucamonga, but it has been a very good year for them to this point, 32-19 and 19 on the season.